AP Psych class. Welcome back for another Flex Time video. Our lesson today is going to start with the scientific method developed by English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon in 1620, presented in his book Novum Aragnum, which is Latin for new method. Referred to as the Baconian method, Bacon's development is considered the first formulation of a modern scientific method. It was also the first modern objection to medieval Aristotelianism, fun word to say, which you can probably tell from its name, focuses on the works of ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Today, the scientific method is an empirical method of acquiring knowledge that has characterized the development of science since its foundation in the 17th century. The method is going to involve the systematic observation, measurement, and experimentation, as well as formulating, testing, and modifying a hypothesis. A theory is going to be an explanation of something that uses an integrated set of principles that organizes and predicts observations. Let's say that we observe over and over again that individuals are less likely to offer help to a victim of misfortune when there are more people present. This is a social psychology theory known as the bystander effect, and we're going to use it for our example. With this observation, we might theorize that the more people around, the less likely someone is to help is going to be a result of the diffusion of responsibility that the circumstance holds. Now this theory sounds pretty solid, right? Our explanation for why someone might not help someone in need when there are more people present is because we think that someone else might take responsibility for it. While this does sound like a very reasonable explanation as to why someone might not help someone in need, we still need to put it to the test. Every theory must include some type of testable prediction that we call a hypothesis. If our hypothesis states that as a result of a diffusion of responsibility, the more people present when someone is in need of aid, the less likely an individual will help. We could set up an experiment revolving around this educated assessment in an attempt to see if we are correct. We can easily break the scientific method down into a six step process. One, make an observation. Two, ask a question. Three, formulate a hypothesis. Four, make a prediction based on that hypothesis. Five, test the prediction. And six, use the results to make a new hypothesis or new predictions. Another important aspect of the scientific method and psychological research is the clear and concise operational definition of concepts. For our experiment on the bystander effect, we can easily operationally define our variables by stating the number of people present during some incident where an individual needs help. Operationally defining variables and other concepts allows other researchers to replicate our observations. If other researchers replicate our experiment and have similar results, it further reinforces the reliability of our research. In psychological research, we are going to have both experimental and descriptive studies. In descriptive research, we are looking for a relationship between variables, while in experiments, we are looking for a cause and effect. In experimental research, psychologists manipulate variables in order to observe a change in another variable. The independent variable is purposely manipulated by the experimenter and is intended to produce a change. Our dependent variable is going to be the variable that we are measuring. Some experiments are even going to contain control variables. These variables are constant and unchanged throughout the experiment. Results from the control variable can then be compared with those of the dependent variable in order to measure change. We hypothesize that our independent variable will have a direct cause and effect relationship with our dependent variable. Let's say with our bystander effect hypothesis, we develop an experiment. And when I say we develop an experiment, what I really mean is we're going to be stealing a famous experiment conducted in 1969 by social psychologists John M. Darley and Bib Ledeny. I also want to take a second to mention how dope of a name Bib is when I have a son. Anyways, our boys John and Bib would stage an experiment where a woman was in distress. In this case, it was a cry for help after a supposed fall. Subjects would either be alone, with a friend, or with a large group of people. Darley and Ledeny would then observe how the different experimental groups would respond to the distressed woman. So what we are going to do next is identify our variables. On our screen here, we have a spot for our independent variable and our dependent variable. In a second, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and identify both of these variables. Remember, as the experimenter, we are in control of the independent variable and we are looking for a change in the dependent variable. So go ahead, pause the video, think of what the variables are. So let's start with our independent variable. This is the variable that we are in control of and that we can manipulate. In our experiment, we set the conditions for how many people are present when a bystander needs help. We set the group settings as an individual, a pair of friends, or a larger group of people. 
So our independent variable is just going to be the number of people. Now how about our dependent variable? This is our variable that we are looking to measure a change in. We are hoping that our manipulated independent variable will cause a direct change in our dependent variable. We cannot necessarily control how an individual will react to a distressed bystander, but for the sake of our experiment, we can control how many people are present when the distressed event occurs. So our dependent variable will be how our subjects react to the distressed woman. And in case you were wondering, results from the actual experiment conducted in 1969 showed that when alone, 70% of individuals would call out to the victim or go offer help. However, when paired with a stranger, only 40% of people would offer help. Now let's say we offer a post-experiment interview and we talk to the subject and ask them why they decided to help or decided not to help. When asking subjects that were part of a larger group why they decided not to help, they state because they thought someone else in the group would. Now we can attribute that to our hypothesis regarding a diffusion of responsibility and state that the statistics from our research prove our hypothesis correct. When conducting an experiment, it's also important for psychologists to account for confounding variables. A confounding variable are going to be other variables other than the ones being studied that if not controlled could affect the outcome of the experiment. A confounding variable in our experiment could have to do with gender. Would our scenario change if it was a man in distress versus a woman? Is a lone woman more likely to help a man in distress or another woman? What about a man? These are the types of questions that researchers must ask themselves before conducting their experiment in order to ensure the most accurate results. Remember, in an experiment we are looking for that direct cause and effect relationship. We want to make sure that that manipulation of our independent variable is a direct cause for our change in the dependent variable. All right, so that does it for our flex time video on the experimental method and identifying variables. In summary, the independent variable is the variable that we as experimenters can manipulate. We are hoping that the manipulation of this variable causes a direct change in our dependent variable, proving our proposed hypothesis correct. We want to make sure we are accounting for any confounding variables that could affect the results of our experiment. We do this in order to keep the results of our experiment as valid as possible. When our data does not match up with our hypothesis, we can then use the results to make a new hypothesis or new predictions. We can, along with other researchers, replicate our experiment in order to prove its validity. Anyways, that does it for me. Hope you learned something there. Peace.